going to ask me to, we're going to divide the meeting into two, just so you're aware. I suggest that I speak on the Christian and politics, and then the Christian and the pandemic. So we're going to first look at the issue of the believer in politics and our relationship to it, and then be able, hopefully, to find time to speak on the believer in the pandemic, and then there'll be a brief time for questions and answers, and then the meeting will be over. So we're reading, first of all, these will all be very familiar portions of the Word of God. Back in Daniel chapter 4, book of Daniel chapter number 4. I have to tell you, you're singing is, we haven't begun singing yet. Uh, your singing is very refreshing to hear. And you do very well with masks. Uh, so it's uh, tempting to go back and talk about maybe trying to sing again. It's lovely. You don't realize you do miss it when you don't sing the worship meeting. You do miss it. And it does add something to it. Very definitely. So Daniel chapter 4, verse number 17. We're just going to read selected verses. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high rule of the king of men and give it is to whomsoever he will and set it up over it the basis of men. This is Daniel, of course, speaking to Nebuchadnezzar and warning him and down just in verse number 25. That they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven and seven times or seven years shall pass over thee till thou shalt know that the most high rule of the kingdom of men and give it to whomsoever he will. Acts chapter 17. I'm just reading some selected verses from a large number that could be referenced. Acts chapter 17. Paul speaking to the Athenians at Mars Hill. And again, here we'll break in at verse number 27. Acts 17 and 27. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they may feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. I'm, I'm missing the verse. Hold on a second. Um, the previous verse, verse 26. Hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they may feel after him and find him and so on. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1 and verse number 4. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world or age, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then one final section, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul's letter to Timothy, and chapter number 2. Verse number one, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplication, prayer, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all their authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty and so on. Now we trust God will add his blessing to the public reading of his word. The foundation of government is of God. God instituted government going back to Genesis chapter 8, came into the hands of men the responsibility for carrying out rule amongst men. That's reaffirmed in Romans chapter 13. So the foundation of government is of God. There have been many forms of government. Everything from monarchy, aristocracy, dictatorships, all the way down to democracy was no less than Winston Churchill who said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried. Now we're not here to promote democracy or to praise any one form of government because linked with the foundation being from God and the forms of government that have existed down through the ages is the failure of government. Government fails for at least three reasons. Number one, the sinful heart of man, both those who rule 
and those who are being ruled. Rulers will take power and abuse it, and those who are being ruled will always try to push the boundary, push the envelope, and try to assert themselves against rule and against law. So one of the great problems with the failure of any form of government is the sinful heart of men. Then there is the satanic power behind governments. Now I know that's we're, we're living in a day when everyone uh, is either rapidly for conspiracy theories or uh, rapidly against it. And uh, a lot of us are very, very shy of conspiracy theories. But I want to just assure you, on the basis of the word of God, that there is one conspiracy theory we can all buy into. We didn't take time to read it. Daniel chapter 10, where the angel speaks about the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia was spoken when he was coming from, from heaven to answer the prayer of Daniel. So behind earthly thrones, behind earthly governments, there are satanic powers. Now that does not mean that somehow they can override God. They can instigate. They can move governments in certain ways. God will overrule and use it all for his glory. But we have to remember that behind earthly governments, there are demonic powers. If you need further scripture proof of that, Ephesians chapter 6. Now I know I'm giving you a a different rendering of the verse, but it is the, the spiritual powers of darkness that rule. There are spiritual powers of darkness that rule in our world. So along with the simple heart of man is the satanic power behind thrones. And then, of course, there are the systems themselves that are all prone to failure. Many, many years ago when democracy was instituted in a Republican, a Republican democracy was instituted in this country, the statement was made that democracy will only work if more than half of the people want the right thing more than half the time. How did you get that? Only will work if more than half the people want the right thing more than half the time. And we've come to live in a day when more than half the people want the wrong thing more than half the time. So the systems themselves all are prone to failure. And of course, from the foundation to the forms to the failure, we want to look ahead to the future. Because there is someone coming who will be able to reign. The government will be upon his shoulder. Absolutely competent, absolutely fit to rule and reign for God. Righteously, justly, equitably, he will usher in a thousand years of an incredible time for this world. But of course, we're reminded that that thousand year reign is just the introduction. He shall reign forever and ever. Of his kingdom, there shall be no end. So that thousand year period is just sort of the, uh, the introduction to eternity. And we have a very great future ahead. Whether we look at Matthew chapter 2, governing the people as a shepherd, Isaiah chapter 9 and so on, we're reminded that he is going to one day rule and reign over this world and be the ultimate politic that will govern our universe. But we want to look at the, at the present time, however, is what involvement should we have in earthly politics? Now, I'll tell you ahead of time and up front. I am not going to talk about whether you ought to vote or not. That's your business. To me, that's a minor thing. If you want to vote. I don't. Your choice. Your conscience before God. But I want to talk to you first of all about the sovereignty of God. We read in Daniel chapter 4 that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. And he gives those kingdoms to whomsoever he will. So that God raises up and God puts down. He is sovereign in the affairs of, of nations. Not only that, but he raises up the basis of men. Now, the word of God would give us clear indication of how God works. Just, uh, just follow me with a series of events that you're all familiar with. We had the Babylonish Empire. That's replaced by the Medo-Persian Empire. That's replaced by the Grecian Empire under Alexander. That was replaced by the Roman Empire. Mere coincidences? When God wanted to, to take his people away from the land of Israel, down to a foreign country because of their sin, 
He raised up the, the Chaldeans. He raised up Babylon. Because the policy of Babylon, when they captured a city or a country or a nation, is that they deported their captives. They took them away from the land of their birth, took them to their foreign land, and put other people in their place. Now, when it was time for God to bring his people back after 70 years, he raises up the Medo Persian Empire because their policy was to leave people in their land. And so Cyrus allows the Jews to come back. And now God is getting ready for the spread of the gospel, and he raises up an Alexander and Grecian culture and Grecian language spreads throughout Asia Minor, even in, from Europe into Asia Minor. And that is one language that almost all of that habitable world could understand when the gospel is ready to be preached. But now there was one other key thing. There needed to be a way for men to, to travel. And so in come the Romans, and they build an entire network of roads. Well, not only Europe, but Asia Minor, all the way into the Levant and so on. And everything is ready for the coming of Christ, the people in the land. Everything is ready for the gospel to spread. One language for everyone. Those weren't just, I mean, some of those men, if you read about the Assyrian Empire, people feared the Assyrians because they were so bloodthirsty. They didn't just come in and, and conquer you and carry away as slaves. They butchered people. They, they raised cruelty, a wartime cruelty to an all-time high. Evil nations, the Babylonians. If you read the book of Habakkuk, he was, he was terrified to think that this bloodthirsty nation was coming to descend upon Judah and carry them captive. Alexander the Great and his military accomplishments are legendary. And of course, Rome ruled with an iron fist. They were not exactly your, uh, your most favorite candidates for, for office. God used some of the wickedest of men, the basest of men. So we are reminded here that uh, God moves in mysterious ways among nations. God's providence is seen. When this country was first established, now if I mention the name of Benjamin Franklin, that may not mean much to people up in North Jersey, but those of us raised in Philadelphia, we have a Franklin Field, we have a Benjamin Franklin Bridge, we have a Benjamin Franklin Institute, every day, Ben Franklin, everything's named after him. And he was by no means a Christian. Interesting enough, one of his closest friends was George Whitfield. George Whitfield stayed at his home when he came to preach in the city of Philadelphia. Next time you're in the city, I'll show you where he preached, on the corner where he preached in the open air. And he could be heard for over a mile away. Tremendous voice. But anyway, Benjamin Franklin himself said, the more I live, the more convincing proofs I see that God governs in the affairs of men. God governs in the affairs of men. So we are reminded of the sovereignty of God when it comes to the, the raising up and the putting down of nations. He determines the balance of their habitation. Great civilizations come and go. Your history book is littered with the story of civilizations that have come and gone. Whether we look at the great Egyptian empires, the early kingdoms, the late kingdoms, whatever, whatever, where do we go? We see tremendous civilizations that have risen up, fulfill our purpose, and become burdens of history. So the sovereignty of God reminds me that as I look at politics, I've got to remember God is ruling. And if I become too espoused to any one individual in that pantheon of heroes, God may well depose him. Not only the sovereignty of God, but the sacrifice of the city. We read in Galatians chapter 1. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. Now, to be contextually honest, I would think that what we're looking at there especially is Judaism. That's what he's going to be dealing with throughout this epistle, going back to Judaism, going back to the law. And he's saying that Christ went to the cross to die for our sins, to deliver us out of this present evil age. With all that it has of religion, and I would embrace all that it has of politics, all that it has of entertainment. It was God's intention. It was by the will of God. He gave it by the will of God. It was God's intention to deliver us from all of that. 
and bring us to himself. We are citizens of heaven. Now, I know you can well claim we are citizens of earth, and we are. But remember, we have a dual citizenship. Twice over, Paul uses that language in the epistle to the Philippians. And it is significant that he impresses it among the Philippians. Because Philippi, as you all know, is a colony of Rome. And they had been granted by Caesar special status. Every citizen of Philippi was a citizen of Rome. And if you wanted to be proud of something in the ancient world, that was something to be proud of, that you were a citizen of Rome. He said, I want to remind you of something. Your citizenship is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior. So he reminds us that we have another citizenship. I think it's remarkable. There is a word that's found only two times in our Bible. Luke chapter 2 tells us that Mary and Joseph went to, went to Bethlehem to be enrolled. The, the idea of a the word that we have there for a tax, that you know, all the world should be taxed, really is the word all everyone should be enrolled. It's like taking a census. It's the idea of being written in a census book. You know the only other place you find that word? Hebrews chapter 10. The church of firstborn ones written in heaven. That means your name and mine is in the census book of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. That does not absolve us from responsibilities on earth. The question. But it does remind us we have another citizenship. The Savior's sacrifice was to wean us away from everything here on earth and keep us from becoming involved. What, then are, what is the saint's responsibility? Now, I only read one of the, of the verses. There are four places in the New Testament, at least, that impress on us the saint's responsibility relative to government. First Peter chapter 2, to obey. First Timothy chapter 2, to pray. Romans chapter 13, to pay. Pay your taxes. And I'm missing one. Titus chapter 3. To display Christ. So to pay him. Pray for To obey him. To display him too. Easy to remember. That's our four, four biblical responsibilities given to us. In this book. For what my responsibility is to the government. I am to pay my taxes. Even if they use that money for wrong purposes. Do you ever consider the widow with her two mites as she put her money into the treasury? I don't want to be too imaginative, but it was out of that treasury that they took their 30 pieces of silver to pay Judas to betray the Lord. The Lord commended her for putting it in. It was the responsibility of the chief priests and the elders. That's what they did with it when it was there. So I, I pay my taxes knowing full well that some of it is going for things that I am very much opposed to. So we, we pay. We pray. Now, again, I, I have nothing against your voting. I'm not making an issue of that. But if you vote for people without praying for them, then you are failing in your responsibility. It's easy to go to the ballot box and pull a, just pull a lever or whatever way you may do it, mail on a ballot. It's easy to do, but remember the responsibility the word of God underlines is to pray for their salvation. So we, we pay, we pray, we obey. Whether we look at 1 Peter chapter 2, obeying the powers of be, or Romans chapter 13, obeying the we are called upon to obey and submit. Now, don't press me if I never go to the speed limit, okay? Uh, that's uh, another story. Uh, but we are to obey as much as possible unless it violates the word of God. When the laws of the land come in conflict with the word of God, then we ought to obey God rather than man. But we have to be sure that it is, it is flying in the face of the word of God. So we are to obey 
And then Titus chapter 3, we are to be model citizens. Be ready for every good work. Display Christian character before society. We should be model citizens in the sense that we are there to care, to provide help, provide aid whenever it's needed. Now, someone will say, what about the scripture examples of those involving government? And so we think about Joseph, second ruler in the land. We think about Nehemiah, the cupbearer. Think of Daniel, upon whom the king. And so we think of people in, in authority, and they were involved in government, weren't they? They were involved, but they weren't elected officials, but they weren't. They were, in fact, several of them were, were really there as prisoners, just elevated to a position of responsibility. I don't want to take any more time. I hope I've made my points here, but I just want to mention one thing. One of the great dangers of Christians becoming too involved in politics is when that comes into the assembly. That becomes the issue rather than Christ. And assemblies can divide, can divide very, very quickly along political lines. That's what's happened. Now, I know nothing about the present administration or the past administration, but people have very, very strong feelings. And all of us have either joy or disappointment over the last election. That's a different issue. But getting so embroiled in it and bringing that into the assembly and knowing who feels one way and who feels another way can begin to create a wall between believers, a gulf between believers. We have enough problems without having to import politics and political persuasions into God's assembly. So I want to leave that and I want to move to the pandemic. But before I do that, I was wondering if there'd be anybody here Chinese that I could say Happy New Year to. So I'm happy to see at least one. Happy Lunar New Year. Begin well. If you're in Singapore and Malaysia, it's already on, but here it begins tomorrow. Thank you for coming. Anyway, turn now, if you will. For another subject, the Christian and the pandemic, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 19. I may read some marginal. Translations for the sake of clarity. The earnest expectation of the creation waited for the manifestation or revelation of the sons of God. The creation was made subject to vanity, not by its own will, but by reason of him who was subjected the same in hope, because the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth. And travail of the pain together until now. Look at verse number 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many creatures. Look at Philippians chapter 4. I know I'm being very superficial and going through these very quickly. Any of these subjects could occupy much more time. Philippians chapter 4, very familiar verse, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God which passes all understanding to keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So maybe. Maybe first Peter chapter one. Peter is writing to a, an area in Asia Minor that is uh, under persecution, and he refers to that persecution in verse number six, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season if need be. Ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations or trials. This is the phrase I want that the trial of your faith be much more precious than a gold that perishes, 
that would be tried with fire when he found them to praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of our Lord of, of Jesus Christ. Now, that'll be sufficient for us to read, but obviously we will be referencing many other scriptures. How do we view the current pandemic? Well, I think Romans chapter 8 reminds us that we live in a groaning creation. Every hurricane, every tsunami, maybe even every snowstorm, but certainly every pandemic, all disease, all tragedy, everything can be linked to sin that has come into our world. Now that's not a that's not an easy uh, cop out. But really, we live in a world that is not the way God intended it to be. We live in a world that is out of order, or I like the word, the idea of a broken world in which we live. This world is broken, and only the coming of Christ and his reign will fix it. It is so broken. And all that we see of disease, whether of pandemic size or the garden variety diseases we all deal with, from heart disease to cancer to high blood pressure, whatever it is, everything is out of kilter. Our bodies are out of kilter. The creation is out of kilter. And everything that we see is really part of the tremendous effects of sin in our world. Now, normally, I don't think it is God's purpose to raise up epidemics and send them and unleash them. He will do that in a coming day. But this is just part of the the fact of sin in our world that has led to disease and has led to the ravages that are left behind in its wake. But yet he is able to use those things for his purposes. The wrath of man is made to praise God. So God will use things. We've already mentioned how he, he used nations that were wicked, nations that were bloodthirsty, nations that thought they were the most powerful people on earth. They could do as they pleased. No one could stop them. No one could check their advances. And so God said, that's the boundary of your habitation. Someone else is coming out. You're going to move off center stage. I don't want to sound like a prophet of doom, and I hope, I hope I am wrong. But as we see what is transpiring in our, our old society, we are, in a, we are in a position where we are actually worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. And Sodom and Gomorrah deserve God's judgment. I fear our nation deserves it as well. Please, I, I, I love my country. Sometimes I think I'm too patriotic. But I fear that what we are seeing is a decline of this country because of its immorality that no longer is tolerated, but it is now legislated. It's gone even further. So the nations rise and nations fall. And we live in a growing creation. But amidst the groaning creation, there can be a growing Christian. That's what I want to leave you with. God will never allow any circumstance into your life and mine that does not have the potential for spiritual growth. Now you may scratch your head and say, how in the world is that ever going to happen now? Here we are. You know, we can hardly, uh, hardly meet and have gospel series, and we can hardly have routine ministry meetings or a series of ministry meetings and you say I can still grow how you view your circumstances will determine how you respond providence controls circumstances faith controls conduct so two people faced with the same set of circumstances can respond in totally different ways that will lead to totally different outcomes. There were two men in the land in the, in, the, in the town of Bethlehem when God sent a famine. One man by the name of Elimelech, he, he chose to leave and he died in a foreign country without nothing but a gravestone to mark his life. Another man named Boaz stayed. They faced the same circumstance. One man has gone down in history in the line of Christ. One of the, not only divine, but one of the lovely types of Christ, pictures of Christ, rather, in the, in the word of God. The other man faced the same circumstances, and he decided to bolt. And he left. And his name goes down in infamy. 
So how you deal with circumstances, how you respond will determine your life. You recall that when the 12 spies came back, the children all sing it. 12 spies went, you know, 10 good, 10 were bad, two were good. The 10 spies says, we, we saw the giants in the land. You know what Joshua and Caleb said? They're prisoners. I don't think they were mocking. I think they were saying, with God's help, they will actually strengthen us. But then as we defeat them, we will be stronger. No, we see the giants, but we see bread. Based on the same circumstances. So how you view the current circumstances, whether you view it as, you know, why has God allowed this? And all my plans are totally destroyed. Everything is messed up in my life. Why did God do this? Could I suggest to you that it's possibly possible, if I understand the words of 1 Corinthians 15 and the end of that chapter, maybe around verse 58, to always abound in the work of the Lord. See, the problem is I have my work. What I mean is I, I've got my plans laid out. Now, I'm not supposed to go here. I'm supposed to go there. I'm supposed to have meetings here. And my wife and I are supposed to take this trip and that trip. And suddenly a pandemic comes and everything is, you know, boom, that's it. Does God's work ever stop? Is God ever kind of paralyzed because of the pandemic? Or does, God work, does God's work continue? See, the problem is I've got to get in tune with what God is doing. If I get in tune with what God is doing, I can be, as I mentioned already, a growing Christian in a growing creation. Now, we read, and I don't want to take away from anyone the comfort you get, from Romans chapter 8, all things work together for good. But if you just keep reading the next verse, you'll find out what the good is. The good is God bringing me into likeness to his son. That's not that everything's going to work out rosy and, you know, that uh, all the children who have left are going to come back and uh, all the bad business deals are going to become good business. No, no, no. God is using everything for this good. The ultimate good is to make you and me more and more like his son down here. Because the goal is to make us just like him up there. That he might be the first form among many brethren. So, so God is working in all of our lives. How we respond to the, the restrictions and the difficulties. Am I looking for, for outlets where I can be used of God even amidst this pandemic? Maybe just making a list of Christians you could call. Who are shepherds, or I mean, now you're able to meet, but there's a period of time where we couldn't meet, and just trying to keep in touch with the Christians and doing what you could to encourage and help. You may say, well, that's hardly the work, hardly the work of God. Do you know one of the one of the most vital ministries that we lack is the ministry of encouragement. We are very good at criticizing. We are very good at discouraging. But to be like a Jonathan who would go to David in the wood and strengthen his hands in the Lord. Tremendous ministry. So I need to be getting in touch with God about what his work is right now that I should be doing. Because I can be a bountiful Christian at a different time in our, in our assembly history. So we are reminded then of becoming a growing Christian in a growing creation. But also we read together of a guiding creed. The just shall live by, well, we didn't read it. The just shall live by faith. We did read about the trial of your faith. What that simply means is that every trial, whether it's a flat tire, a dead battery, a traffic jam, a canceled flight, something more serious, uh, some, some other greater trial, Whatever trial it is, it is going to test what you think of God. Is God in control? Does God have a purpose in all this? Now you may say, you yeah, know, I'm exaggerating. Really? If I'm in a hurry and I get into a traffic jam, you know the first thing that comes to my mind? Doesn't God know I've got to get there? Well, you say, I'm a pretty poor Christian. Sorry, but that's the truth. First thing that comes to my mind is questioning God. The trial of your faith. So then what we're in 
may not seem like a, a great trial to some of you, but certainly every one of us is affected in some way or another by what we're going through. And in a very real sense, it can become a trial of your faith. Faith is not mindless, blindless determination. And somehow you were to get through this, uh, you know, the signs, we're in this together, we'll get through this together. You know, the, the mantra of society around us. Faith is coming to the word of God and appreciating the character of God, his faithfulness, his steadfastness. So faith always has the word of God as its basis. Faith does not say we're going to be out of this by June. If the word of God told me that, then that would be faith. But the word of God doesn't. But the word of God does tell me that God's in control. Speaking recently on Psalm 23. Hard to find something fresh and new to speak about in Psalm 23. But one thing I appreciated was the psalmist says, Thy rod and thy staff, they come from. Now, the rod in Scripture is always a symbol of authority. And the staff is a symbol of care, protection. So there is control in one hand, there is care in the other. So the shepherd that you and I have not only has control of everything, but he also has a care for you individually. And I would also mention one other thing about that song, apropos of what we're looking at. And this is one of the most difficult things for me to deal with. Yea, though I walk, not run, not jog, not sprint, I have to walk through the valleys of life. All of life's difficulties, through all of the shadows of life, I have to walk. I cannot run. Sometimes the walk is a very long walk. So we do not know how long what we are dealing with will last. Hopefully it will. Already some indications that there has been a downturn. It'd be lovely to think it will be over by summer, but we don't know that. But we do know that God knows, and we can have confidence in, in God that he is in control. So that really brings us to a governing confidence. I don't have to understand everything. In fact, the verses we read in Philippians chapter 4, the peace of God which surpasses understanding. In fact, I think what Paul is saying is, I would rather, I would rather know God than know all the answers to life's questions. The psalmist time and again says, Hope thou in God, I shall get praise and so on. Many, many times he encourages his own soul. He does a lot of soul about it. So in the goodness of God, you and I can continue the work of God. Look for different ways. I think over in Ireland, where they can do it, they're having open, what do you really call them open air meetings? What would you call them? Parking lot meetings. Driving, driving gospel meetings, where they're getting more people listening. People that have been away from the whole prodigal sons and coming and parking their cars and listening to the gospel. I'm not big on, on Zooming, but Zoom has reached more people with the gospel during this interval and likely we have been able to reach in any other way. So, so there are outlets, there are ways of being able to connect. And so it's our responsibility then before God to seek to find ways in which we can be useful. We may not have the explanation for everything right now. But we should have absolute confidence in God that He is working. Someone mentioned to me recently that why isn't it the case that people are turning to God and getting saved in droves? I mean, you would think that this would, you know, people are, are more conscious now than ever of the frailty of life. To think that a, a small microscopic virus can paralyze the entire world. And, and take take away hundreds of thousands of lives. And people are so conscious of how frail and, and fragile life is, you would think there'd be a, a revival and souls getting saved. They said, do you think this is really a, a preview of how despite all of the plagues that God sends in a future day, men are going to just blaspheme God and, 
and reject them despite all of that. They will be what's happening. It will be a little for you in many, many ways. What we're seeing around us could almost be viewed as a, a foretaste of what's going to, who would ever believe that the world could come to a standstill? The governments would suddenly impose restrictions and powers that we thought were absolutely unheard of. But amidst all of this, we can have confidence in God. And we can look forward to a day when perhaps we'll understand. I don't know what you think of, of C.S. Lewis. Most people either love him or hate him. But uh, I'm one of the ones, one of the former. C.S. Lewis said that the, uh, the most common word when we get to heaven is going to be, oh, oh, that's what that person means. Oh, that's why God left. Oh, that's why that, you understand what I'm saying? Suddenly the, uh, the obscure will become very, very plain, very obvious to us. And so I know we've rushed through these things. I wanted to leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. These two issues, politics and the believer, and our involvement in a political world, and the pandemic, and how we can be growing Christians in a growing creation. How we view the circumstances, how we bow to those circumstances, how we seek to use them to further the work of God as committed to us. Now we'll just take a moment to pray, and then we'll open the forum for anyone with questions or even comments if you want to add to what I have said. Please feel free to do so. Speak to God in prayer.